Shimano. Hi, everybody. Uh, Ken Gagne, who needs no introduction, and in fact has in the past introduced so many people at Kansas Fest himself, um, is going to tell us about more steamed apples. Is mine on? Yes. Hello? Yes, it's on. Yes. It is? Yes. Oh, I can't hear that from here. Great. Okay. Well, I feel like I'm already contradicting contradicting Martin because I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, so welcome to my talk. Hope everybody's having a great Kansas Fest. Hope everybody is staying hydrated. You know, with all the hard work that we're doing, it's important to stay refreshed. My talk is More Steamed Apples, which is a continuation of last year's talk. You don't need to have attended that talk to thoroughly enjoy what I'm about to present. The show notes for this talk will be found on my website sometime in the next week and a half. I'm not somebody who puts their slides online because I don't feel slides, my slides, the way I design them, they don't speak for themselves. If they did, I wouldn't need to be here presenting them. I would just give you a PDF and go home. So the full show notes will be found online with links to all the stuff I'm about to talk about. So a little bit of context. I have, for the last three years, been hosting a podcast called IndieCider. And on this podcast, I would interview independent game developers. These are people who are making their own games without large sums of outside capital or investment or without selling the intellectual property rights to a third party studio. So that means that they get to retain creative control of their games and they get to do some really cool stuff. Sometimes it's not always profitable, sometimes they're just doing it for fun, but their idea is to do it for a living. And they're often able to, to have these fantastic stories that they share with me on their podcast, on my podcast. I actually just ended this podcast earlier this month after three years and 64 episodes. And in that time, I played 64 games and a lot of others that didn't necessarily make the cut. So I am happy to present to you some of those games today. If you, uh, how many people here are modern day gamers? Like they play on PC, Xbox, PlayStation, two, three, four, five, okay, six. Well, I hope to get a few more of you playing. And if you are looking for somewhere to play games, that place would be Steam. Steam is an online game marketplace. It is for PC, Mac, and Linux. And you can go online and you can search for games by genre, like over here there are a whole bunch of tags, like action, adventure, casual, indie, racing, RPG, simulation, sports strategy. And you can find <laughs> games for all those platforms and more, including VR, like Oculus Rift. And the games range from 99 cents to $25. Sometimes they're from small studios, sometimes they're from major studios. You can connect with other people who have Steam accounts, play online against each other, compare your stats. And speaking of stats, here are mine as of yesterday. I have 347 games in my Steam account, <laughs> which is about $4,000 worth of games. I've played for about 113 hours, which isn't all that much. And in fact, 50 hours of this is because I accidentally left a game on pause in the background. <laughs> And I didn't realize it would count. I thought it would only count if it was the front most app. That's like how you get a who puts a car exactly. And so I asked them, can you remove those 50 hours from my account? Because I don't want it to be inaccurate. And they said, no, we can't. Maybe you really were just sucking for 50 hours and you want it removed. And I'm like, that, I don't suck at games. But anyway. <laughs> so this is exactly, almost exactly, 100 games more than this slide last year and $1,000 more. I did not spend $1,000 on games in the past year. I was not buying one game every three days. As a result of me having this podcast, people wanted to be on my podcast and have me play their games. So they would email me. Here's my inbox. Uh, Fumiko, Steam Key. Major, Major Tori, Steam Key. Your Tanks vs. Alien Steam Key. People just emailing me. I didn't even ask. They just said, here's our free game. Come play it, please. It's usually $5, $10, $15. Just play it for free and put it on your YouTube channel. And I'm like, okay. I can't give these Steam codes away to other people because that's not why they were given to me. And so sometimes I just redeem them and download them and maybe I'll play them, which is why I said 82% of the games I own, I have not yet played. They're just sitting there in my account. Evan? So uh, you mentioned Steam. What are your thoughts on uh, GOG, good old games? So there are a lot of other online game marketplaces like GOG, itch.io, Humble Bundle, etc. The games I'm going to focus on today are solely for Steam. Uh, there are pros and cons to each, but Steam is a game marketplace where you install a client for PC, Mac, or Linux to download these games. And I'm going to show you 
some Apple II games that if you liked these old Apple II games, you should probably try these Steam games. They may not be by the same developer, they may not be the same franchise, but the gameplay, the aesthetic, something about them is very reminiscent. And I think that there are a lot of parallels between game design of 30, 40 years ago and today. Sometimes these developers of today are people who grew up with the same games we did. And we, now that they are their own game developers, they are inspired by the stuff they grew up with and they want to recapture that, but in a new aesthetic. And so they've made new games that are very similar to what we grew up with. So I'm going to show you some old Apple II games. If you liked those, here are the Steam games you should try. More often than not, the Steam games will be available for PC, Mac, and Linux, but I can't guarantee that. You should check online. Sometimes it's Windows only, which is a bummer for me because I'm Mac only. Sometimes they're PC, Mac, and Oculus Rift, which I mentioned earlier, which is kind of cool. But anyway, they are all available on Steam, and like I said, show notes will be available later. So, let's start off with some genres. Arcade. Arcade-style action. By the way, I'm not going to be playing the games while you're watching me, because I would probably, you know, take a while to boot it up, and then I die, and then configure my controls. So these are all videos I'm going to be showing you. Sometimes it's a video of me playing the game. But nonetheless, these are self-playing videos. Crystal Quest. I've heard people playing this just this past week. I was walking down the hallway, and I'm like, what's that sound? I know that game. Crystal Quest is a classic game that I think was originally released for the Mac and then ported to the Apple IIGS. And there was a sequel, Crystal Crazy, as well. How many people here have played Crystal Quest? Yeah, it's a fantastic game. So you have this little orb floating around trying to collect all the jewels. You can shoot bullets at these things that come at you. Once you collect all the jewels, you go through the escape hatch. And if you get a bonus, sometimes there's like this Rube Goldberg-esque machine that calculates your score. If you touch anything, you die, which is, you know, a good lesson for life, I suppose. Just keep your hands to yourself. So. Apart from diamonds. What's that? Apart from diamonds. Diamonds? You can touch diamonds. Oh, okay. So, so if you liked Crystal Quest, this is one of my top three indie games from last year. I highly recommend a game called Ellipsis, spelled just like the piece of punctuation, Ellipsis. Uh, it is originally for iOS, and then he released it for Steam as well. And it's very similar. So you, I am this ball here, and I'm trying to collect these little uh, other blue dots that show up. So one, and then two, and then three, four, five, and then make my way to the exit, all without touching anything. And the levels get more and more frenetic. That is not the first level. And you don't even have to collect all the dots. You can see I missed a few right there. And eventually you get to branching paths and you can choose which level you want to go to. Uh, it has some very innovative touch controls, different <laughs> patterns you can choose. Like you can put your finger right on your character and it'll move wherever you go. But then you can't really see it because your finger's blocking it. So you can actually do an offset as well. Like you're an inch to the left, your finger. So you can see where the finger's moving parallel to your own finger. Uh, it's, it's really great. It's available for Steam if you want to play with a mouse or a touchpad. I enjoy it most on iOS. A uh, lot of fun. It, this was this developer's first solo game ever. And this episode of the podcast was the first time he'd ever been interviewed, which was really exciting. And this game sold gangbusters, and now he's working on his next game. So I highly recommend Ellipsis if you like Crystal Quest. I'm going to take a quick drink here. Action adventure. I combined these two genres. And actually, there were so many games that I may be skipping a few. But let's start with uh, Dino Eggs by David Schroeder. Classic Dino Eggs game. We actually just reviewed the original in Juice Yes uh, about last year, I think. So this is a time travel platforming game where you go back in time to save dinosaur eggs and bring them back to the present. So you're this time traveler, there's your time warp gate, and you can warp around the level, and you have to pick up all the dino eggs and bring them back to the gate with you, while avoiding all the natural dangers that exist in prehistoric times. So there might be mama dinosaur, who suddenly decides to stomp on you with her foot. Uh, there are mosquitoes and worms and all other things trying to attack you. And again, you touch anything, you die, because... <coughs> That's a good action-adventure aesthetic, I guess, or gameplay mechanic. Uh, that spider is falling down trying to get you. So there was a 
indie developer who really loved this game and he wanted to make his own homage to it. So he came up with his own sort of indie sequel and he called it Dino Legs instead of Dino Eggs. Uh, not an authorized sequel. But David Schroeder, who made this game, he's still around. He was on the internet. He found this game called Dino Legs and he's like, what the heck? I didn't make this. What are you doing making a sequel to my game? I didn't authorize that. So the developer of Dino Legs said, oh, do you want me to take it down? And David Schroeder said, no, I want to work with you to make it an official sequel. And so they, <laughs> and so they created Dino Eggs Rebirth. Uh, this came out early last year, 2016, even though it says 2015 there. So it was like the 24th anniversary or 34th anniversary or so. And this came out for a whole bunch of platforms. Here's the trailer, the official trailer for Dino Eggs Rebirth, where they compare the original and the new one. So now you're playing as the original explorer's daughter. So you can see it's a... Shoot everything that moves? I told you there's no shooting. But you can drop boulders. Find dino eggs. Press new dino eggs. Or pick a future. Watch out for dino bomb. Catch baby dinos. Capture baby dinos. Rescue baby dinos. Or mouse. Dino bomb is not pleased. Oh. Eat prehistoric flowers. Get contaminated. Contaminate others. Devolve into a spider. Find healing powers. Power up the time points. Start fires. Smother fires. Play at night. Smash creatures. Smash other players. Find spider friends. Rescue your daughter. Rescue your dad. Even steal baby dinos from each other. So as you can guess with an indie game, that was David Schroeder you were hearing narrate, talking about how... Uh, all the different modes you can play as. There's a puzzle mode where you have a limited number of moves to finish a level. But my favorite actually is the multiplayer mode. You can play four players simultaneous where you're all running around trying to get the eggs at the same time. I hooked up some joysticks to my laptop and gathered some friends around and it was really cool. It was a lot of fun. I found the uh, traditional action mode very similar to the original. I, I didn't think it was a huge upgrade, but when we added more players, it was a lot of fun. So if you want to go back in time with your friends and save baby dinosaurs, Dino Eggs Rebirth is your game of choice. Uh, a little bit less action, a little bit more adventure, Out of This World. One of my favorite games growing up. I actually played on the Super Nintendo, which as you know has the same CPU as the Apple II GS, which made for a pretty easy port. Anybody remember this game? Yeah. Uh, known in most of the world as Another World. It was only in the United States it was released as Out of This World. Uh, which was a little confusing because it was also like a 80s sitcom about this young girl with time-stopping powers. Uh, anyway, I guess that was my generation, not yours. So anyway, you are, I don't know what, I forget his name, Muster the Unlikely or something, and you're running around trying, you find yourself on this alien world. You've conducted an experiment with a, pi a physics particle accelerator, and all of a sudden you wake up and you're being besieged by strange creatures, the likes of which you've never seen before. It uses rotoscoping graphics, which was relatively unheard of back then, especially on the Apple II GS. And in every particular environment or situation, there is a correct action to take. Like here, you have to run from the tiger all the way to the left, grab the rope until it breaks, then gr run all the way back to the right. Uh, and then here, you bump into an alien who shoots the tiger, and you think you're saved, but then the alien actually captures you and puts you in a cage. If you actually know all the correct steps to take, you can beat the whole game in about a half an hour. But figuring out what those steps are without cheating can take you hours, days, weeks. <coughs> there was a sequel that only ever came out, I think, for the Sega CD called Heart of the Alien. And I don't think the original developer was involved in that. But I always wondered how the story ended, so I watched it somebody played it on YouTube. Uh, this game has been re-released for iOS, Android, Steam, you can play like the 30th anniversary edition. So it's actually really easy to get a hold of. 10 years ago, that was not the case. I could not find this game anywhere. People had heard of it, it just wasn't easily accessible. Now it is. But I also recommend a game a little bit similar, a little bit more action-y called Outland. Originally released for the Xbox 360, we actually talked about this on one of the very early episodes of the Open Apple podcast. I don't remember why. I think, Steve, you were on that episode, actually. So that might have been like episode number four or something. And uh, Outland is 
similar to a game Jeremy was just showing me called Chameleon Run, also similar to an old action, uh, an old shmup game called Radiant Silver Gun, where uh, you are either blue or red, and you can swap colors at any time, and you can only stand on platforms that are the same color as you. And you can only be hurt by bullets that are the opposite color of you. So you're exploring this world, trying to find items and increase your inventory, defeat the bosses, and save the world. And all the time you're constantly swapping colors while you're going back and forth. So a little bit less puzzle-like than Another World, but the graphics are very similar. Sort of like a uh, silhouetted, real but not quite real kind of look. Uh, it's a great game, and I really enjoyed it when it came out like five years ago. I made it all the way to the end boss, and they were just too hard. I'm like, ah! I played it for like five, six hours. I just needed to play it for six hours and ten minutes to win, but that last boss just got me. Anyway, here's a game I hope everybody knows. Just from the footer, you should probably recognize it, and then the game opens up. It's Load Runner, one of my favorite Apple II games. I was on this other podcast called New Game Plus, where three guys spend seven days playing one old game, and then they talk about their experiences. They had me on as a guest. They said, Ken, pick any old game for any platform any year ever. What game do you want to play for a week? And I said, Load Runner. They'd never heard of it because they're all younger than me, and they said it was actually the oldest game they'd ever played on their podcast, and they loved it because at the end of the podcast, all three of them have to give it a thumbs up or thumbs down, and all three of them gave it a thumbs up. Uh, great game. I loved it a lot. And you can still play it nowadays because just a week ago today, July 13th, Load Runner Legacy came out for Steam. This is a Windows only game, but it is an official sequel. It's by the people who own the rights to Load Runner. And they've made a whole new Load Runner with a very different aesthetic, for better or for worse. Uh, so it, they're kind of going for a super enlarged pixel look, I guess, to play to the retro scheme. But this is Load Runner Legacy. And even though some people are not huge fans of the graphics, you can see that the gameplay is the same, where you're running around trying to capture gold. There are these guards who are chasing you. They may have gold that you need to get from them. So you dig holes, they fall in, and you bury them. You can also make your own levels, which is one of the appeals of Load Runner beat, uh, back on the Apple II. Actually, I think it's how they got all the difficult levels for the Championship Edition, was people made their own and submitted them. It's also actually how Doug E. Smith made the original Load Runner, was he crowdsourced it to the neighborhood kids and had them make levels. And there are also the original 150 classic levels, as you just saw, in the original aesthetic. So that's an easy way to play the Apple II game on Windows today without downloading a ROM or installing an emulator. Just grab Steam, grab Load Runner Legacy, and it's in fact 20% <coughs> off for the first week of its release, which ends today. So if you want to get Load Runner Legacy, today's your last chance to get it at 20% off. Such a deal. So. What's your commission? None. I get no commission. There's, I do engage in affiliate marketing, but not on Steam. So, a hundred percent. Anyway, let's move on to a different genre: survival. I want to show you a game that everybody played when I was a kid, and which was in this presentation last year: Oregon Trail. Everybody wants to make their way from Independence, Missouri, all the way to uh, Oregon. What part of Oregon are you going to? Williamette Valley. That's it, Williamette Valley, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it is 1848, you're stocking up on supplies, you get to choose to be the banker or the carpenter, you get to caulk your wagon to ford the river, you get to buy oxen. You know how Oregon Trail works. Classic graphic right there. Uh, it's on the cover of the Oregon Trail card game that came out last year. It's been parodied a number of times. In fact, last year I showed you a game that started off as a parody and then became a full-fledged game, and that was Oregon Trail. Not Oregon, but Oregon, O-R-G-A-N. It was the zombie apocalypse, and you've loaded up your station wagon, you're trying to make it out west to a safe haven free of zombies. It's actually a really good game with a lot of innovation, a lot of new features. They started as a joke on Facebook, it was just a Facebook game, and then they released it for Steam, iOS, PlayStation 4. Like, you can play Oregon Trail on everything. But that's not the game I'm here to talk to you about today. I'm here to talk to you about The Flame in the Flood. This is from a company that was formed in Boston when the company that made Bioshock 
went out of business. Irrational Games in Boston. They were a huge employer in the Boston area where I'm from, and all of a sudden they released all these developers into the employment market. So a lot of them formed their own studios, and one company was formed called Molasses Flood. Molasses Flood is actually a historical event in Boston where this uh, canister broke open and flooded the city with molasses. So much that people actually drowned and died. Like this was a tragedy in the city of Boston. And now it's a company making video games. So the flame in the flood is similarly set after a flood. The world has flooded and you are floating down a river, uh, Mark Twain or Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer style, and you get to land at these little islands or you can sail past them if you want. But each island has something that you may need. It could have uh, some animals that you can trap and use their skins or pelts. It could have uh, somebody who's willing to trade you for something. Uh, it might have parts for your boat so you can upgrade it to make it sturdier so that when you hit the rapids and you bump into a rock, you don't drown. It's a really, really difficult game. It's a resource management game. If you've played something like Don't Starve, it's, it's very similar to that, and which is probably one of the reasons I'm terrible at it. It's also uh, what's known as procedurally generated, which means every time you play, it's a completely different layout. Uh, the river bends in different ways, the islands are in different locations, and what you find on those islands is different. So to give you an example, you might build a trap like that. If you can find enough lumber, with, if you find an ax, cut down trees, build lumber, set a trap, capture a wolf, use the pelt, stay warm, so that it, when it rains, you don't get cold and die. Jim? Uh, are these different versions that you could get in different runs of the program, are they generated uh, at the time, or are they just stored, and <coughs> eventually it will run through all the different storage? So the question is, is there a set number of paths that are stored and it produces a different one every time you play? It picks from a pre-generated set? And the answer is no. It is generated on the fly every time you play so that you are experiencing something that has never been seen before by anybody, including the developer. Now, it's drawing from a limited number of options. Like, on the island, there are only like maybe 100 different things you can find. And obviously, different combinations of those 100 things. But it's still a finite number you'll probably never see every combination. I don't think that's possible. But The Flame and the Flood is a really good survival game. Uh, so they actually, when they were building it, they went on Kickstarter. I backed the Kickstarter, if you're looking for conflicts of interest there. And they advertised it as Oregon Trail on a River. And so uh, I found the end result was very similar to that with a lot more additional modern features like the resource management. Puzzle games. I actually have Carrington to thank for this one because I had a modern game I really wanted to talk about, and I said, what old game is this like? And he said, oh, that's a lot like Pipe Dream for the Apple II, which I didn't even think of because I played Pipe Dream on my Game Boy, my black and white Game Boy, the original model, which some people have called the Fat Boy. Uh, Pipe Dream is a game where it has a starting point, and they give you these tiles that you cannot rotate, and your job is to build a path for the liquid to flow from that starting point all the way until a certain number of tiles. That number expands as the game continues to make it longer and harder to play. But right here, you can see that he's built a path that's gonna go this way, and right now it's gonna hit a dead end unless he puts something there. <coughs> but the tiles that he's given are randomly chosen, so he might not have what he needs in time. And oh no, it flooded. Game over, man. <coughs> so. Uh, this is a lot of fun. It's something you can play over and over because it's different every time. Again, a finite number of tiles, but you never know which one you're going to get. You can see in the upper left corner there which one is supposed to come up next, so you can do a little bit of planning. Uh, but yeah, and he needs a curvy piece there, and he didn't get it. That's really hard. Yeah, so he really uh, built himself into a corner there, which is not a good idea. Uh, <laughs> I, if you like Pipe Dream, I really recommend World of Goo. Now this game is already about 10 years old because it was a launch title, or nearly so, for the Nintendo Wii, which came out, I believe, yes, in uh, November 18th of 2006. I knew I had that somewhere. Uh, World of Goo is an awesome name for a game. It's also an awesome game. So 
what it does is it gives you all these little blobs. And the blobs, they, they, they love each other. They want to connect to each other, just like people do, right? And so you get to drag and drop them and form these structures from this living goo. <coughs> but your enemy is physics, because you can see he's trying to build a bridge across that he can connect to these other blobs, but the bridge is starting to lag or collapse. So right there, he built a little bit more support into his structure so it doesn't fall all the way over. And he has a finite number of these blobs to work with. So he has to drag and drop them to build this bridge. Get the sign out of the way. Come on. This is not me playing. And there is a story. There actually is a plot line. And they are told through these signs that you find. You don't know who wrote them. He actually like is a hidden character, the sign painter. And uh, oh, oh, he almost has it. Come on. If you get close enough, you wake up the other ones. Yes. And then they join your little cadre, and then you can use them. So you expand your number of finite number of blobs. And your job is to build a path up to here, and any blobs you haven't used get sucked up into that pipe. And you need to save a certain number of those blobs. And he did it. Great. And that's the structure he built to make it happen. <coughs> so you can build up, down, left, right. Again, if you build it too tall, it might fall over. And there are levels where you have to build very tall towers and get it just right. Kind of like when you're uh, sitting at the restaurant and you start playing with the cups of cream. And you just build towers and they fall over. And then Denny's brings over your moons over my hammy. And it's, anyway, <laughs> slight tangent. Uh, but yeah, so World of Goo is a great game. Anybody ever played World of Goo? Yes. Yeah. Fabulous. Oh, like it's four or five game. of you. What's that? Yeah. yeah. I like it a lot. And uh, it's available for almost everything. In fact, they just released it for the Nintendo Switch, <coughs> which is a brand new video game console that just came out four months ago. And it's a 10-year-old game, but they figure there may be people who still haven't played it yet, and the Switch might be their first opportunity to do so. I recommend it on a system that you can do uh, point and touch or point and click, so that's why it was really good for the Wii when it first came out. Uh, if you have a trackpad or a mouse, I guess that would work too, but... Uh, probably a mobile device would be even better. So, anyway, World of Goo. Here he is playing with the albino goo, which has the exact same properties. But the, the goos themselves, I don't believe, change. See, he has to build them all the way up there to that tower, which is ridiculously high. So, but yeah, if you like uh, Pipe Dream, I recommend World of Goo. Lemmings! I, I think, uh, I, I don't remember what studio made this for the Apple II. Has anybody heard of them? Anyway, the FTA, that's right. I knew it was some French group. The FTA, that's right. the French United Crackers Clan. That's right. Or, or French Touch? I don't know. There, there's so many French groups. They just start to blur together after a while. Uh, anyway, so Lemmings, which was originally created by Psygnosis. Hi, Jason. Hi. DMA Design. That's right. I'm sorry, DMA. Who then made Grand Theft Auto. Right, right. And then ported to the Apple II by Brutal Deluxe. And this is a game where you have these little lemmings. They're you know, almost like Smurfs. And you get to assign each one a job. You have a limited number of jobs that you're allowed at the beginning of the level. In this case, you're given, I think, 10 diggers. <coughs> and you have 10 lemmings. So you make each one a digger. They dig a hole. They drop down. And then they march to the exit. And thus, you have saved your lemmings. Other lemmings include uh, umbrella lemmings, exploding lemmings, uh, crossing guard lemmings that stop people from walking certain places. Stair building lemmings, mining lemmings, where they take a pickaxe and they dig a vertical or a horizontal hole. And there, you've saved the lemmings. Very good. Uh, if you like lemmings, oh, and there's the soundtrack. Now, see, this one, if they fall too far, they go splat. Oh no! Oh, but he assigned them the umbrella job. So that's the occupation you get in this level. You get 10 umbrellas to use, you give them to your 10 lemmings, and they safely parasol down to the exit. Phew! Alright. So, last year I got a pitch to cover a game that I'd never heard of, and they said, hey Ken, if you like lemmings, you'll like Inklings. I was like, tell me more. I don't know how they knew I liked lemmings, but Inklings originally came out for iOS, now is available for Steam, and it's almost the exact same idea. Uh, on this level, build a bridge, and they come out of that hole on the left, and you need to get them into that hole on the right. And these are, it's using a portal, if you ever played Portal, so it goes 
down there and comes out there. And uh, he built a bridge. And he assigned them wall climbing ability. Or when they pass that little spider, it makes them able to climb walls. And that's how they got them up to that hole. Because you change their ability. Oh, but sometimes you can't save everyone, but you've saved enough. You have to save four inklings, and he saved four, not all five that were available. Yeah, it's like lemmings. Yeah, it's very like lemmings. Uh, so there are some of the jobs, I think. I don't know, actually, this game has a very unusual aesthetic. The art style is... There are some levels that look like they were drawn with crayons, and that's intentional. It's not that it's bad art, but he's trying to make it look like a children's <laughs> playroom. And you can see it right there. He didn't even stay in the lines. <laughs> My goodness. Uh, but yeah, you can you can make portals to make them teleport to different places, give them jobs, try to save enough of them, and you'll succeed. So. Inklings. Very similar to lemmings. All right. Tex Adventure. You wouldn't think that there'd be a lot of modern equivalents to text adventure, but in fact, the text adventure community is super alive and super fanatic, very much like Apple II enthusiasts. They love making new text adventures in systems like Inform, which we saw earlier today. This, of course, is Zork. Uh, you, you are west of a house, you're sitting in an open field, there's a small mailbox here, you can go in different directions, you type north, south, east, west, get lamp, get axe, kill goblin, etc. Uh, very technically possible for a, a system that is not very graphic intensive, uh, just a lot of text. Modern machines like this one that I'm using here can do really complicated and advanced graphics. And so, of course, you can also do just text. You can have text adventures on a modern machine. And this one in particular is Lead Light Gamma. Lead Light was made by an Apple II developer named Wade Clark in Australia. And he released, it, he developed it in Eamon or Amon for the Apple II? Amon? E A M O N is how it's spelled. I made Amon games when I was in grade school. It's a fantastic system where you can uh, carry players from, you, you create a character, you can carry it through all these different adventures. You can go to the Amon Adventurers Guild website nowadays and still download hundreds of different adventures that you can go on. It's a lot of fun. And so Wade Clark took his Lead Light adventure that he released for Eamon and he ported it to Inform, which is the modern interactive fiction engine that a lot of people use nowadays. So this is the Inform version of Lead Light. If you've already played it on the Apple II, it's very similar, except now it has a lot more features like an auto map, so you can actually see how the rooms connect and where you've been and what the exits are. It has a soundtrack. So there's actually music that plays as you go from room to room. Uh, you can save your game, of course. <coughs> it's built, I think, in a system called Gargoyle, so you don't need to install anything. It just like comes with Gargoyle, you launch it, and it runs. And uh, it's a lot of fun. When he submitted Lead Light Gamma, no, I'm sorry, when he submitted the original Lead Light to the annual interactive fiction competition, which JuiceGS supports every year with donations of prizes, he won what was called, I think, the Golden Banana. For the, he had the biggest difference between the highest score and the lowest score. Yeah. So like some people are like, oh, this game is okay, might be an eight, maybe a nine. Eight and nine, not a big difference. People with Lead Light, they're like, wow, this is amazing. This game's like a 10. I hate this game, this game's a zero. <laughs> you win the Golden Banana for the biggest range of scores. And I think one of the reasons he got such a low score is because the original Lead Light was built in Amon. You had to have an Apple II or an emulator to run it. Everybody else was running on Inform. You just download it to your Mac. It works. But with his game, he's like, no, you need to have a machine from 1977 or an emulator with a ROM that you can't legally procure. So here's a ROM grabber for your 1977 machine that you own, of course. And people are like, are you serious? You want us to go through this much work to play a game? Zero. So now he can play it on the Mac. It's uh, native to this operating system. Super easy, super fun, and unlike the original, not free. He actually is now making it a commercial game because games and developers who do hard work deserve to be compensated. And also, if he released this game for free when other interactive fiction developers are releasing their games commercially, he's undercutting them. He's setting a new expectation that games should be free. 
and they really shouldn't because people work hard on these things. All right, I think this is my last genre. I actually cut out some because I want to be sure to get to this. This is very similar to text adventures, but I'll go through some of the ways it's different and why, even though I have just nine minutes left. So choose your own adventure. This is a twist a plot from Scholastic Microzine. If you've ever met me at any previous Kansas Fest, you know I love Microzine. A twist of plot is just, like I said, a choose your own adventure, just like the books were, where there is a story being told, and at certain points in the story, it asks you, what do you want to do? Do you want, like in this case, uh, it's a haunted house adventure. That's the Belnord Manor, I believe. And the, the story begins with you waking up in the middle of the night, dripping in sweat, because you had a nightmare. So, press space bar to continue, come on. There you go. You're about to enter a twist of plot story. And there you are at home, it's 3 a.m., and suddenly it says you wake up in the middle of a nightmare because you dreamed you saw Kevin Savage trapped in the old abandoned <laughs> Belmore house. He was screaming to you for help. But was it really a dream? And so the game asks, what do you want to do? Do you want to go back to sleep? Do you want to call Kevin to check? Or do you want to just go directly to the Belnor house? It's 3 a.m., you wake up in the middle of the night, and you're going to believe a dream. So even though I typed 2 there, I actually typed 3, and I go to the house because I am so concerned for Kevin's welfare, and I have so little faith in his ability to watch out for himself, that I'm going to go to the Belnor house at 3 a.m. and make sure he's okay. So that was a choose your own adventure. You pick 1, 2, or 3, and the story proceeds from there. You can even just draw a map to see all the different branching paths of which way you can go. Now I actually have I think four games I'm going to recommend if you like Choose Your Own Adventure. The first is called Emily is Away and this game has all kinds of nostalgia built into it. One of my first instant messages besides you know, CompuServe and Genie chat rooms was AIM. So I would get on AOL Instant Messenger and I would pull up my friends list and I would chat with people. And that's what this game replicates. It starts off where you're a uh, senior in high school, you're a guy, your friend Emily is online and you're chatting with her and you're talking about how you hope you stay in touch when you go to college. And every time she says something, you are presented with some choices of how you want to reply. And you can, <coughs> so right here, uh, it's waiting for me to type something in and I type on the keyboard and no matter what letters I actually press, it's going to type the option I chose on the previous level. So I'm not actually typing Emily Howdy. I could be typing ASDF, ASDF, and Emily Howdy shows up. And then I press return, and she talks to me. Xenon is the screen name I used when I was in high school uh, because I love elements on the periodic table. And so we're chatting. Now she says, what's up? Nothing much. The ceiling talking to you. Just like in AOL, I can choose my fonts, my colors. I even choose my uh, avatar, which says Lord of the Rings, because those movies were just coming out back then. Uh, this character is a bit younger than me. I was out of college when Lord of the Rings came on, but I can still empathize with what he's going through, because online communication with people of whatever gender you're attracted to can be super awkward, no matter what age you are. And uh, so this was a lot of fun for me. The sequel actually just came out. I think it's called Emily is Also Away. No, Emily is Away 2. T-O-O. -O. Uh, but this game, the first one, is free. It's absolutely free. So not only is it a choose your own adventure, but it's also AOL Instant Messenger with all the sound effects, which I don't have playing right now, but you hear the door open when somebody on your buddy chat comes back online. It's ridiculous. Another game I recommend is Open Sorcery. <laughs> open Sorcery. Not Open Source. Uh, made by Abigail Korfman. And it is basically like a hypertext adventure where you play a sentient firewall. You are a fire <laughs> elemental who has been bound to protect a computer network. Okay. So everything in here, it's, it's sort of like Shadowrun. It's a combination of technology and magic. <coughs> and every day you scan the local area to make sure that there are no other spirits or ghouls or uh, demons trying to infiltrate the network. And you do that just by clicking on the red text. So here, what do you want to do? Do you want to talk to this person? Do you want to alert your creator? Do you want to do nothing? And you just click on the option you want. 
I asked the creator of this game, why do you choose this sort of inter interface instead of a text parser, like a text adventure? She had a fascinating answer. It was the longest episode of Indie Cider I've ever done because we had so much to chat about. She said that with a text adventure, there are two games you're playing simultaneously. One is you're trying to decipher the logic of the puzzle and how to solve it. Oh, I need the key to open the door. Oh, I need to give the comb to the mermaid. Okay, I can figure that out. The other metagame you're playing is what commands does the creator want me to use to convey that solution? In this game creator's opinion, one of those games is fun. The other one is not. Oh, you want me to use get instead of take or drop instead of remove. I understand how to solve the puzzle. How do you want me to solve the puzzle? That's frustrating for her. So she says, this is just the first part of the game. What, how do I solve this puzzle? And there are multiple different endings. Like in this game, you can interact with different people in the environment, build relationships with them. And as you get to a certain point in the game, you need to have a certain proficiency of relationship in order to recruit them to help you fight these demons. And I got what I considered a bad ending. I was able to defeat the enemy elemental that was trying to infiltrate the network, but at the cost of my own life. I was just gaining sentience, but I had not convinced enough people to help me because I had made bad choices earlier. And so I started the whole game over and I played it again and got a little bit better, but still not the ending I wanted. But it doesn't look like much, but of all the games I've played for Indie Cider podcasts in the last year, I probably played this one the most because it was so much fun. The Warlock of Firetop Mountain is another modern game you'll like if you like Choose Your Own Adventures, or if you like Dungeons and Dragons, or if you like game books. Has anybody here ever used a game book? Ever played with a game book? Jason has. Anybody else? Yes, Ralph. So a game book, it's kind of like a Choose Your Own Adventure. It's a print book, but very often there are random elements involved. Like, do you want to fight the goblin, it says? Yes. Well, in that case, roll the dice that came with the book. If you rolled a six, you kill the goblin, go to this page. If you rolled a two, you didn't kill the goblin, go to this page. It's like a one-player D&D adventure that you don't need a dungeon master to run you through. Hmm. The Warlock of Firetop Mountain was a game book that was published by Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone in 1982. There have been multiple games based on it, the latest one just came out last year, and I am such a fan. So here I am, I hope it's not too dark for you to see, I'm just entering the dungeon, and it says, do you want to turn west, or do you want to turn east? And so right there, there is your choose your own adventure. Which part of the dungeon do you want to go to? And you can't see the rest of the dungeon. You don't know what the result of your action will be. But I choose turn east, my little piece jumps along, like it was on a board, which is super fun. And then it says, oh no, there's a, the sound of marching. Do you want to face what's coming at you or do you want to hide inside this little hole in the wall? Again, <laughs> a, a choice. So I'm gonna choose to hide and he ducks into that little corner. And then it says, oh, there's a goblin army marching by. They don't see you. Do you want to jump out and attack them and get the surprise element or let them pass? And I choose let them pass. Uh, let's see, can I, whoops. I was trying to jump ahead in the video because there actually is a, let's see, turn that on. Yeah, I have a minute and a half. I will be done by then, which is super exciting. Here we go. And at certain points in the game, there are monsters and you get to fight them. And it switches to a grid-based battle system. So everybody moves simultaneously, so you need to predict their action. So I choose, I'm gonna move to this path or this block right here that tile, and then there are three slime zombies. I can choose different camera angles to see exactly how it's laid out. And when I move, so does everybody else. And then you can, uh, you can attack them. There are also different characters you can choose to play as, like the ranger, the cleric, the thief, the fighter. They all have their own backstories. Like at one point, I went into uh, the dungeon and somebody said, oh, I know you from so-and-so town. I'm like, I didn't know that, that's cool. Uh, last game I want to bring up in my last 36 seconds is Firewatch, which came out for PS4 and then for Steam. And it is a game set in 1989 in uh, not, uh, the Shoshone National Forest, just south of Yellowstone. 
you are a fire tower fire watcher, and you are uh, trying to decipher some mysteries that are going on around town, which is very odd in the forest. And Delilah is talking to you. She's her boss, your boss. She's talking to you on the CB radio, and she gives you choices of what you want to do. And so you go exploring through the forest while you are trying to solve these mysteries. Uh, so here I am in the forest walking around. I'm out of time. And you get to examine different things, pick up some inventory. There's no fighting, no monsters. Uh, this is what some people call a walking simulator because there's no way to die. You're just exploring an environment. But the story that is crafted over the 90 days of the one summer that you're in this forest, it is super awesome. It's very compelling, very engaging. I love this game. The voice acting is fantastic. Uh, I think it features one of the main actors from Mad Men, actually. Uh, which I never saw, so I can't tell you who it is. But that's it. So if you want to get a list of all these games, they'll be posted to Apple 2 Bits in the next week and a half. You can subscribe to RSS or email subscriptions, both free, to get at my monthly, my weekly updates every Monday. And do I have time for questions? Yep. And I don't have time for questions, but I'm here all week, so feel free to chat with me about games anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Ken.